Abused as a child, he turned to drugs and lashed out in anger. I was a user and abuser of people. Everything that happened to me, I did to someone else. Find out what someone said that hit him like a brick in the face. Plus, New York Times best-selling author and pastor, Jensen Franklin tells us how to love like you've never been hurt on today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, welcome to the show. It's March Madness time, and that means plenty of basketball. As high school basketball teams finish their seasons, we want to highlight one exceptional team in Illinois. Cherry Prina is the coach of the girls' Eureka Hornets. At the beginning of the season, he shared Colossians 3.23. Whatever you do, do with all your heart. The team's seniors decided to use that verse to keep them motivated and focused throughout the season and even put the verse on the back of their team T-shirt. Though the team finished fourth in the state, it was their best season in school history. Senior Natalie Bardwell told the Peoria Journal Star, we wanted to be those lights that we can be and we just want to be the ones sharing the gospel, even if it's as simple as sharing a verse on the back of our shirts. She then goes on to say, I think that we represented Eureka well and we also represented God well this entire season. I love, it's just a love noble this endeavor. Story. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's wonderful. Uh, students saying, yeah, let's take a stand. Whatever we do, let's do with all of our heart. Mm -hmm. as, I'm, uh, as I'm seeing this story, though, I'm also reminded of the cheerleaders who actually sued because they had Bible verses. Uh, they were able to, to win and be successful. Uh, but, you know, we need to be vigilant in our country today. And we need to stand up for our rights That's, for yes, freedom of religion. We have the right to express our religious beliefs. Well, Duquesne University won't make this year's NCAA tournament, but that just leaves more time for good deeds. Recently, Duke sophomore Mike Lewis noticed a woman sleeping in her car near campus and then decided to share some of his post-game meal. Well, Mike's video has now been viewed by two million t people on social media, and he says he wanted to inspire others, and helping people is God's plan. I feel like there's more good in the world. We just focus on the negative things instead of the positive things, and I'm just glad people actually focus on the positive things for once. I've just been waiting to see him again to thank him. <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks, Mike. Yeah, big thanks, Mike, from all of us. That's a wonderful thing to do. Let's focus on the good, and let's focus on how we can be good to others around us. Yeah, I love that. When you see something, do, do something. something yes. That's awesome. Well, Norbertus Gija is a Lithuanian student athlete playing college basketball at Jacksonville State University. He hasn't seen his family since leaving Lithuania for the United States and college five years ago. His coaches wanted to give him a long overdue reunion with his mother, and it was all caught on video. Take a look. Hey, what's the film? We're, we're, we're documenting everything this trip because we want this to be a memorable time, but we got all the coaches in here because, you know, it's, it's winning time, right? Yes, sir. And, Mike, what'd your mom, what'd your mom used to tell you about Bell Whitmans? Yeah. You need them? I got to get them regularly. Like when was the last time you had one? Oh man, that was like what? Eight years ago? I'm tired I'm tired of I'm tired of belt with you myself, so come on in here. Vinny, the real thing here for you. No 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 Bell with me. Hey, come on, you said you needed one. Come on. That's awesome. What a moment. That doesn't bring tears yeah. to your eyes. I don't know what does. Wow. Never too old for a hug from mom, huh? <laughs> oh, that's true. I got one myself the other day. <laughs> Matt Gork is a health and phys ed teacher in New Jersey who loves the Philadelphia 76ers. And recently, Matt and his wife received heartbreaking news. Though they have two healthy boys, the couple suffered their fifth miscarriage in seven years. Matt opened up to his 11th grade class and let them know about his family's difficulties. That's when two students decided to do something. The class raised money to send Mr. Grork and his wife to a Sixers game. They also gave him a card which read, We want to show our thanks for teaching us. Keep your head up even when life hits rock bottom. Well, that message impacted the teacher even more than the basketball tickets. Take a look. 
to come from juniors in high school that are 16, 17 years old as a parent um, and what's going on in this world and uh, on the news and media, it was pretty amazing to see some young adults do that and show that kind of compassion and empathy. So get this, after sharing his story online, the Philadelphia 76ers threw in another 30 tickets so bad students <laughs> could join him and his wife for a date night at the game. Yeah. That's on <laughs> March 13th. That's a big date, but anyway, <laughs> uh, hats off to the Sixers. That's a wonderful thing it to do really for that is. entire class. That, yeah. that is great. Mm -hmm. Well, up next, how to love in spite of hurt and betrayal. New York Times bestselling author, Pastor Jensen Franklin show, joins us to tell us how that's possible right after this. Well, as Christians, we're well aware of the chaos that can sometimes invade our lives. However, we often forget that those shepherding the flock can face troubling times as well. And Pastor Jensen Franklin is sharing his hope in light of hurtful and trying times. Jensen Franklin is a New York Times bestselling author and the pastor of Free Chapel Church in Gainesville, Georgia. When his oldest daughter began to stray in college, there was constant friction and life behind closed doors was like a war zone. In his book, Love Like You've Never Been Hurt, Jensen shares glimpses of the tests and struggles in his life and offers four ways he found to love, even in the midst of difficult circumstances. Well, Jensen, you join us now. What, what was it like? As I understand it, your daughter was just a model child growing up. Yeah, we, my wife and I have been married 30 years. We have five children, four daughters, and then a son born in that order. And we were the picture-perfect family. And, uh, you know, there, there is a unseen pressure of being a pastor. And, you know, we have six campuses and a lot of people and on television. But... <sighs> We were the picture-perfect family, and then she went off to college, and same old story, just did what, what some of us did. I did it, and lived the party life, made some wrong choices, wrong people. But she got in deep, and we knew something was wrong. I'll never forget one, one day I was preparing to preach and had about 30 minutes, and my wife burst into my office, and she was in tears, and she said, I guess it's that, that uh, wimp, wimp, a woman's intuition to know something was we had to do something she said we've got to go get her and she was absolutely right so we drove up to the school and brought her home it was tears and she was ready to come home she she wanted we we, we might have saved her life bringing her home and we thought things would you know we're on the road to recovery but it got worse it got darker and she ran away and to make a long story short it devastated our family and it devastated the siblings and our, our home dynamic changed. There was a lot of arguments, a lot of, and you know, we decided this was 10 years ago. My wife and I just decided to talk about it because we, I, mean, I hear it all the time. I hear it all the time, Gordon. You know, something's happened in our family and we just don't get along. We don't speak anymore, live in the same town, got relatives across the city there that you never even talk to, never have a meal with. There's a sickness in the body of Christ. There's something wrong with Christians that we can't, we can't get beyond our conflicts and our hurts and our offenses. There, it, with your daughter, there was a sort of defining text that she sent. What, what was that? Yeah, she had ran away from home and, uh, and she sent a text and, and said, Mom and Dad, I'm married. I got married today. A justice of the peace married us. And as a minister, you know, as a preacher, uh, that was devastating to me, to her mother. Um, we were broken. And um, the next week I had a, few, a wedding and it was one of her mm. friends. And I watched the father walk that daughter down and give her away. And it devastated me. It was everything I could do to, to hold it together. And it began a uh, a bitterness in me. The book is not about that. I think the, the story of my daughter is about two pages. The rest mm -hmm. is what happened to me, how that affected and Sharice and how it, it affected our marriage and how it affected the other siblings who we had other challenges with, with some of the kids. 
And the bottom line of, of, of what begin, we begin to experience is I, I, I realized that something has changed. I was bitter. I was mad. I was angry. I was, I was easily set off. That was not, that's not even who I am. Some people who know me, and I'll tell you when it all came to a head is, is uh, one, of, one of her sisters was in a big argument with this daughter when, when things were at its worst. And they were screaming at one another. And, and she said, I hate what you have done to our daddy. I hate how mm. you changed him. I hate how he doesn't laugh and he's not fun like he was when we were coming up because, and, you know, and, and then, it, then I realized she didn't do that. I let the enemy do that to me. I have offense. I have bitterness. I have anger inside of me. And, and that began... I heard this phrase called love like you've never been hurt. Mm. And I thought, I don't know why, but it had such an attraction to me. It actually came from a, uh, uh, they, they, they're not completely sure, but they think Satchel Paige, I don't know if you know that name. I know that name, But he yeah. was the first African-American pitcher during racist times, you know, uh, sports were segregated. He was the first African-American pitcher in the professional baseball. He's in the Hall of Fame but they would hurl racial insults, the racists would, from the stands. And a reporter stuck a microphone after his first game and said, uh, said How did, what, what are you going to do about that? And he said, I'm going to love like I've never been hurt. And then I got to see, and, you know, that's exactly what Joseph did. That's exactly when he, you know, when his family hurt him and broke, you know, went through everything, falsely accused, offended, he, he loved like he had never been hurt. It's exactly what Jesus did. It, it's easy to say that. Yeah. And I see the attraction. Well, oh, there's on. a process to it. Yes, it is. So what was the process for you? It's, it's, it's so true. And, and you know, that, that's the biggest thing that I want people to take away from the book, that, that sometimes it's not instant. Sometimes I, you hear this cr phrase, forgive and forget. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? I, does forgiveness mean you get amnesia? How do I forget? How do I forget if somebody abused one of my children? How do I forget if, 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 a, if a spouse walked off and left you with three kids and a bunch of bills and they're having the time of their life and you're, you're, you're going through hell? How, how, do I, how do I forget that somebody stole hundreds of thousands of dollars in a business deal? It's not that you forget you remember it differently. It actually becomes a point of reference of how far God by His grace and His work in your life has taken you. And you, it, it's, I, I, look at, I look at how God has helped us and now my daughters, all of them are serving the Lord in full-time ministry. The, the battle I had was with the son-in-law. Hmm. It was, and, and here's the honest truth. I wish it, I could say it was some service and tears flowed and we hugged and kissed. But the truth is, it's still to this day, they're, 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 if I allow it, that stuff can come up in you. And so, you know, it's, it's, uh, I, I give an illustration in the book about the old ketchup bottles, the vintage ketchup glass bottles. Now they have the squeezable plastic Heinz 57. And if you want it, you just squeeze it and it comes out. But that's not, that's not how forgiveness is sometimes, especially when you've really been hurt. It's more like the old glass bottles. And, you know, the you number get, 50. You get really hard. Yeah. I, I used to stab it with, with, with <laughs> you know. But, but here's something you'll find out if you go to Heinz.com. Mm. I didn't know this. They said only 11% of ketchup users know this, that the reason that they have the number 57 on the Heinz 57 ketchup bottle is it was strategically designed, the, the bottle was, that if you will tap where the 57 is, it will bring the quickest release of the contents. And if you've ever done that, you know it's, it just, it's a slow process. That's how forgiveness is. You get open. First step is to get open. I'm open to reconciliation. And I remember some of those first meals with my family. It was tight. It was tense. It was awkward. It was holiday. You know, you, you just get through it and, and do the butt, tap, tap. You, you ask and you keep on asking, pray and keep on, and little by little, those gushes of forgiveness, those gushes of love and reconciliation begin to happen. And I believe that's what God wants to do in millions of people's homes and families. I agree. I believe yeah. He wants to He's restore. He's asking us for reconciliation. Yeah, and, and it's got to start with me. Yeah. At some point, it doesn't even matter who's right and who's wrong. At some point, you have to separate 
the action from the person. I, I, I don't, when I say I forgive, it doesn't mean that, that I agree. What you, what you did may have been wrong. You, it, it, there's no defending it. But I can separate the person from the action because that's what Jesus does for you and he does for me every day of our life. He, he says, I forgive. And now he says, turn around and love like you've never been hurt. Amen. Amen. Jensen's book is called Love Like You've Never Been Hurt, Hope, Healing, and the Power of an Open Heart. And I think this is a universal. I think all of us go through this uh, and realizing that love comes from a place where you're in him. Uh, that's what releases it. I encourage you to get it. It's available where, wherever books are sold. And thank you for thank being you with so us. Thank you so much. Yes. Great yeah. to be with you. All right. Terry, over to you. Well, coming up, a man at the end of his rope. There's only one thing left, and that's to die or make a new um, approach at living. Find out who helped him make the right choice. That's next. After 10 years of drug addiction, Wayne Bradley was barely alive. He was emaciated, shunned by people, and living under a bridge. Wayne was also snatching purses to feed his addiction until the day one of his would-be victims shut him down with a simple gesture. When you get down to 90 pounds and a shoestring around your uh, waist for a belt, when people lock their doors, when they see you, when you've given up, there's only one thing left and that's to die or make a new approach at living and I was just tired man I was just tired Wayne Bradley's story begins over 50 years ago in his home on the south side of Chicago where he was physically and verbally abused by his father you were always guessing always guessing what you would you know what kind of reaction you would receive um, there was always uh, the fear I think would have permeated the air more than anything else Embarrassed about the abuse, he told no one, and soon became a loner. I was always scared, um, always um, shame. I was always, um, I think that even in the pain and in the times that I was hurting the most. I was always afraid that something would happen, that um, something would happen because I knew, even at that early age, I knew that it couldn't go on like that forever. Uh, and I just was always afraid that something would happen. And it did. It did. After high school, Wayne joined the Army and served four years. For the next 16 years, he worked as a trucker and then as a security guard. But drugs and alcohol were a constant problem. I think the main reason I was an addict, I used so many drugs, is because I was trying to hide. I was trying to hide from, not only from the things that had happened in my life, but I didn't want to face me. I was a user and abuser of people. Everything that happened to me, I did to someone else. Um, I was not good news. I was not good news. And um, from military to 96, I was, a, I was a mess. That mess was about to get much worse. It was April 1996. Wayne went to see his parents, only to find them dead in their home. Both had been brutally stabbed and beaten. Then he learned the killer was his older brother, Craig. It became probably the biggest challenge of my life, telling you I was totally messed up and I was strung out on all kind of drugs and alcohol. I was mad at, at my family, I was mad at my dad, I was mad at God for putting me in such a screwed up family. Wayne lost his job and over the next 10 years he became emaciated, shunned by people and barely alive. And ultimately it ended up with me living under a bridge in homelessness and addiction and I had submitted my life to that. Wayne became a purse snatcher to support his addictions. One time at a bus stop, he saw an older lady who was a perfect target. And I'm looking at her purse and, and she's looking at me and she just said, young man, no matter what you 
do to me, I just want you to know that Jesus loves you. And it kind of just like somebody threw a brick in, in my face because Jesus loves me. And um, she said, let me show you something. And she pointed at a, at a cross and it was up in the sky and it was like 40 by 40 foot cross in a place called Victory Outreach. And she said, we can, they can help you if you will let me take you there. Wayne agreed to go with her. I was tired of hiding. I was tired of running. I was tired of getting high. I was tired of being scared. I was tired of lying. Um, At the church's recovery home, the people treated Wayne like family, and he learned about Jesus Christ for the first time. What I really learned was that he was real. I saw him in the people who accepted me and at my worst, who loved me unconditionally. Wayne had a glimpse of what could be, but his addictions were stronger than his will to get better. Eight months later, he was back on the streets looking for his next fix. In 2007, Wayne went to prison for larceny. Purse snatching had finally caught up to him. And when I got to prison was when I really found myself alone. And, I'm, and you know what I mean? Where I didn't have anything else but God. And I got my hands on the Bible and I was reading and I was finding out more and more about Jesus. And I realized that I was right where God wanted me to be. And uh, that's when I gave my life to Jesus. You know, I started getting a personal relationship with Jesus and I wanted more. After serving nine months, Wayne was released from prison. That same year, he married Jackie. God changing him to be a man who is um, confident in who he is in God, as a man of God. And when he speaks to you, he speaks to you from his heart, looks in your eyes, and you can just see the pain, the sadness is gone, and it's been replaced with a peace. I've forgiven my brother for the crimes, for the murder of my parents. Um, we, we talk now. He calls, um, actually just called the other day. Um, he calls on a regular basis. We write to him. We send him things that he needs. Together, Wayne and Jackie founded I Can Celebration Ministry. Sometimes that's what has to happen in order for God to get your attention. He's got to get you somewhere where there's no distractions, where there's nothing else but you and him. And that's what he did for me. Wayne has been clean and sober since 2012, and he now has a new perspective on his struggle with anger. I thought I was mad at people, even with my brother with the murders. I thought I was mad at him. And all this time, I've just been mad at God because he never did things the way I thought he should. But now, <laughs> I understand why God did things the way he did and wants us his grace. He's taking us through something to get us to something. But I'm gonna pay attention to Jesus when he shows up in my life. I'm gonna pay attention to him. You know what I mean? And, and, and here's, the, here's the good thing. Jesus will go anywhere. And he'll meet you wherever you are. He'll just love you too much to let you stay there. You know, the Bible says that he leaves the 99 to go after the one who's lost. Boy, Wayne has so much truth in what he shares with all of us in his story. You know, when things happen to you when you're a child, the number one emotion that most people feel is fear and you just run, you just hide, you just want to get away from it, you don't want to feel it, you don't want to see it, you don't want to be it. And so we, we harness all of that junk inside of us and we hang on to it and we let it, without realizing it, begin to define who we are, but it's not who we were created to be. You're a child of God made in the image and likeness of your heavenly Father. He created you with plan and purpose in mind, and his word says that he saw you before you were ever formed in your mother's womb, knew you, had your name carved in the palm of his hand, wanted to call you his own, invited you into his presence, into his family. You know, earlier, Pastor Franklin was talking about the power of forgiveness. You know, that's part of what happened in Wayne's life. He let go. He said, God, this isn't who I want to be. This isn't how I want to live. These feelings, even anger toward God, this is not 
what I know will make my life matter. I'm letting go of it. And I'm just going to let you be God. It's the beginning of an amazing journey of forgiveness, of healing, of wholeness, and vision for who you are, for the future God intended for you. No matter what's happened to you, no matter who you are or where you're at today, God's love is extended to you. If you need to pray with someone about healing and wholeness and forgiveness, our number's toll free and the person answering it is somebody who's already found that. 1-800-700-7000. Call now, a friend is standing by to talk with you. Gordon? Here's a word in closing, it's from Colossians chapter three. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. That's a good word to meditate on. Whatever we're doing, let us do it unto the Lord. God bless you. We'll see you again.